Full disclosure, right from the jump, when I first saw three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri last year, I genuinely enjoyed myself. The cast is unimpeachably phenomenal and the snappy dialogue is right up my alley. There was one aspect of it that I could not forgive, but my respect for everything else it did well overshadowed said aspect. But defending a piece of a movie that one personally finds indefensible as a means of preserving the film as a whole is intellectually dishonest, and it's time I face facts. Months later, after the dust has settled and we can all think clearly about this, including myself, Three Billboards really did completely botch how it dealt with subjects related to race in America. In the film, after the death and rape of her daughter, Mildred buys advertising on three billboards that question the competence of Sheriff Willoughby, who has made no arrests. Willoughby's most outspoken defender is a racist, abusive police officer named Jason Dixon. This officer tortures black people, calls Hispanic men racial slurs, and in at least one case, abuses women. He tries to make Mildred take down the billboards. Willoughby, dying of cancer, commits suicide, but Mildred's billboards are blamed. Dixon throws the young billboard salesman out a window, nearly killing him. He faces only mild consequences from this, the loss of his job instead of, say, a charge of attempted murder and a prison sentence. However, we, the audience, are never given that option, that thought. We are meant to believe that his dismissal is more than enough. Later, he attempts to discover the true identity of Mildred's daughter's killer, but he comes up short, and he and Mildred go off to murder someone who may or may not be a criminal, but definitely is not the killer they want. Whether or not they do it is ambiguous. During one scene, Mildred is arrested for defending herself from a dentist with a grudge. Mildred asks Officer Dixon, how's the N-word torturing business? Only she doesn't say N-word. She says it. Dixon is taken aback and clumsily remarks that she can't say the N-word, only people of color torturing. This routine goes back and forth for a while before Sheriff Willoughby comes in and Dixon, flustered, explains himself. Willoughby excuses Dixon, barely registering what happened, and tells Mildred that Dixon has a good heart, and that if all police officers with slightly racist leanings were removed, there wouldn't be enough police officers. African-American author and poet Hanif Adurakib wrote about his experiences while watching this scene and the film in general, and his experience compared to the experiences of the white theater audience around him. Everyone in the theater around me laughed. It was, of course, supposed to be comic relief. I haven't seen many reviews mentioning the torturing gag. I haven't seen any review that asks about the joke's purpose or who the punchline might be serving. The joke is that the white cop who tortures black people is trying to stop calling them the n-word. Or maybe the joke is that McDormand, the righteously angry white protagonist, has a black friend, one of two black people we see in town, but still thinks provoking a joke about the n-word is funny. In the conversation about being the only one in the room, we mainly talk about black people in professional settings. I think about it in those moments, of course, but I also think about it in movie theaters, particularly when I'm at a movie that uses race as a narrative vehicle, a movie that uses black people as part of a storytelling device, but doesn't cater to black people or show the faces of many black people on screen. I imagine then that perhaps the problem of three billboards is one of who it is being made for, the type of people who might laugh at an extended gang about n-word torturing in the first act while looking forward to the redemption of a racist and abusive police officer in the third. So let's talk about how white filmmakers often portray black characters relating to white characters. Throughout the vast majority of the history of Hollywood, the heroes of film were, and still are, white. It was, and is, a reflection of how America mythologizes its majority. For white audiences, cowboys shooting Native Americans is glory, but for a person of color, it is a threat, a comment once made by author and activist James Baldwin. The 1958 film The Defiant Ones, in which a black man and white man are chained together, is built on a misunderstanding of the nature of the hatred between white and black people. When the black character jumps off the train, the white moderate liberal audience were relieved. The black man jumped off the train to reassure white people to make them know that they are not hated. 
that even though they have made mistakes, they have nothing for which to be guilty. This observation comes directly from the Baldwin documentary, I Am Not Your Negro, which I recommend for further insight on this matter. Films of that era would occasionally broach the subject of racism, but never dig deep enough to offend white audiences or risk white fragility. It had the opposite effect of its seemingly progressive veneer. It told white audiences that only the most egregious and unambiguous hatred is racism, and that if you were not as bad as a Klansman, then you were fine, and that racism outside of extreme cases like lynchings did not exist. It's the 21st century now. In Three Billboards, Dixon is that extreme case, and much like in The Defiant Ones, when the white man is at his lowest, he is rescued and therefore forgiven of his racism by the only black characters in the film, thus forgiving this racism to the audience. Dixon serves no jail time for his many crimes. The torture of a black man off-screen, the bogus arrest of a black woman, a prop for the film to use, the attempted murder of an innocent man, the assault of a woman, Race seems to exist in the film mainly as an indicator of white characters' moral development. Meanwhile, the film's black characters exist as decorations in the narrative. After Dixon is fired and injured, we are meant to believe he feels bad, but no actual change of heart appears on screen. No revelation about his racism, for example. The rest of the film is a redemption narrative for a monstrous human being who we are meant to feel sorry for. By this point, viewers might even have forgotten about Mildred and her murdered daughter. Dixon's redemption becomes the whole movie. But redemption? Only that he tries to become a proper detective, not actually admit to his wrongs. See, in spite of Dixon's racism and abuse being so extreme, the film tells us, even before his redemption arc, that he has a good heart and that he is a decent man, because Willoughby, the angelic voice of reason, says so. When Willoughby dies, his narration through his letters becomes the voice of God. He says that deep down Dixon is a good person. The audience is meant to see him as complex. He goes from mad racist to concerned detective in what appears to be the span of a few days. Redemption. What redemption? Do you believe that Dixon is redeemed by planning to murder a man at the end of a film? His sins were that he abused his power, brutalized people, and took the law into his own hands. At the end of the film, he and Mildred plot to do the same thing. Murder a man who may have committed a crime, but with no proof. And the film frames this as redemption. The idea that the film portrays Dixon's conclusion, writing off to murder someone who might be bad, as redemption, shows that the filmmaker does not truly understand why Dixon is so terrible, why the system that protects men like Dixon is so terrible, and why our expected forgiveness of such men is so terrible. A smattering of the film's defenders called Dixon nuanced, but nuance alone does not qualify for redemption. The narrative of the film tells us that even questionable cops are good cops, and the movie pushes this narrative from the moment Willoughby, the most sympathetic character in the film and voice from heaven, excuses Dixon for his behavior, torturing a black man, to the interrogation room scene, to the letter exonerating Dixon, and so forth. The film asks us to invest in the minds of racists, even though Americans are not asked to invest in the minds of minorities. Certainly not in this film. I mentioned that there was so much of this film that I admired, but as soon as the film asked me to invest emotionally in Dixon, instead of the prop African-American characters, I saw the ugly side of the film, the obliviousness of it. The lack of the ability for the filmmaker to read the room and check the pulse of America right now. There are Dixons all over my country. In the film, when Dixon brutalizes the billboard advertising salesman, he remarks that he assaults white people too, masking his racism. Let's face it, for some people, that is enough. White defenders of racist police officers in the real world try to use the claim that, overall, more white people are killed by police officers than black people. But what they don't say is that black Americans are actually far more likely to be killed by the police. 
Any analysis of police killings will of course show that in absolute numbers more white people are killed in police shootings than black people in America because non-Hispanic whites comprise a roughly five times greater share of the United States population. So any analysis that is based on nothing more than absolute numbers does not take demographics into account and is therefore inaccurate and misleading. Black Americans account for only 24% of those fatally shot and killed by the police, which may seem smaller than what one might think, except when you take into account there being just 13% of the United States population. Black Americans are roughly 250% more likely than white Americans to be shot and killed by police officers. People who try to defend city police as being without racial bias try to fudge the numbers without explaining the relevant math and context. In doing this, white Americans portray the police who commit questionable actions as a few bad apples, instead of explaining the provable statistical pattern of behavior. There is a fact-checking Snopes article in the description for further reading. Dixon does not actually try to redeem his racism, he tries to help a white woman, and he fails. He does not pay any restitution, but the film clearly wants us to believe that he does. The price of Dixon's redemption is so high that even if he had been successful and helped Mildred, it is completely unrelated to his racism and would be inadequate. The claim that this is a story about redemption cannot be used as defense for its troublesome writing and missing the mark when it comes to race in America, especially America of the past few years. Three Billboards was nominated for a bevy of Oscars, and while some were deserving, like the acting noms for sure, nominations for Best Original Screenplay and Best Picture are dubious. At least those were unsuccessful, though. But this has been the case in moderate liberal white Hollywood for ages, and as I said, I'm at fault too. African American journalist Zach Cheney Rice said of this, The fact remains that the Ebbing Police Department's ineptitude is indivisible from its institutional bigotry. Both set the plot in motion, and both mark who audiences are meant to root for. Confining black characters to the margins of a story that doesn't deal with racism is one thing, Using said racism as a fulcrum of your story while treating black characters as props is another. What should give pause is that such work is being celebrated with scant pushback and rewarded by a Hollywood apparatus that claims to know better. I can't take credit for this observation, but Three Billboards feels like a movie that will make white audiences feel better about their racist uncle. He, like Dixon, isn't so bad, right? He's quirky and funny and a harmless buffoon. Ugh, oh god, I just realized the country boy cop is named Jason Dixon. Like, Mason Dixon line? Ugh. You sure do get America, Martin McDonough. Hi everyone, if you like what I do, please click on the orange Patreon link below. That's how this show happens. It's also the only way to request an episode. Also, please like, share, subscribe, and click on the notification bell so that you never miss an episode. I'll see you next week.